think it's it's fair to say that optics is not different from electronics um, except for a few things, and um, that's the carrier frequency. Um, hmm. I consider optics the same as RF, but at 194 terahertz, and that's roughly what the what the um, telecom window in communications in in uh, nanometers expressed in terahertz is. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Double E's Talk Tech. My name is Mike Hoffman. And I'm Daniel Bogdanoff, and we're joined today by Stefan Lofler, who's from Germany, and he's spent the last roughly 20 years working with optics. So today we're gonna, he's going to enlighten us. We're going to sit at the feet of the, the master here, and he's going to tell us about the marriage of electronics and optics, how they play together and, and some interesting similarities between the two. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Willkommen. Happy to be here. Thank you. So I Stefan, practice my German when I can, which Stefan, is not often. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so Stefan was in town for OFC. So if you're at OFC, you might recognize him. Stop by the Keysight booth. Um, but Mike and I really don't know much about op the optical side of things at all, other than you know I know that light is a good thing. Um, so can you maybe give us an overview of you know, what optics is as a whole? Yeah, may, maybe I, I don't start at light and, and the sun and so sure. on, but um, at optics um, as <laughs> a means of communication. <laughs> so we have um, a sender and a receiver, and uh, we have a channel in between. The channel, um, in our case, is mostly fiber optics. Um, there are some exceptions recently. Um, there is, for example, um, free air transmission also, like in... Hmm. in uh, uh, RF technology, we can go through free air, but that's the exception. Uh, Is that like lasers through air? Yes, or? yes. Okay. Yeah, it's actually two telescopes um, that are oh, directed cool. to each other, and um, the the beam is big enough to survive a at least one um, pigeon flying through. Okay. <laughs> will, will the pigeon <laughs> will the be pigeon okay? Survive? Yeah. Yeah. The pigeon survive? Uh, the pigeon would survive it, yeah, yeah mostly. <laughs> <laughs> that's different from microwave. <laughs> Fair enough. No, but let's go to the fiber. So um, when I started um, my studies, we were invited to, to visit um, a company nearby Stuttgart who was making fiber in, in what they called um, a Kabelwerk, a cable works. And um, they were proud to show us optical fiber. Um, obviously, illuminated with red light. And uh, all of a sudden, we all believed, yeah, red light is the right thing to do. And um, optical communication must work with red light. Um, it later turned out it was a little more red than I thought. It was actually infrared. Um, but illumination with infrared is not something you can really enjoy. So they did this little trick, um, illuminating a spool of fiber with a uh, laser in the 630 nanometer area. Now... Um, <laughs> when they hired me later at um, was that at that time HP, um, the lady asked me, "Hey, can you explain to me a communication channel?" And I got, "Okay, yeah, okay. There is a transmitter a channel and a receiver, so that's where we stand today." Um, the transmitter, in 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 the case of fiber optics, is usually an, a laser today. Um, they have tried LEDs as well because they're cheap. But LEDs are incoherent, they are broadband, and it turns out that um, a narrowband laser is something you can do much more with. Um, so the, the way a laser works, right, is it's one coherent frequency. So is that what makes it easier, whereas an LED is kind of a messier... Yeah, for today's technologies, an LED wouldn't work anymore. At that time, an LED was just good enough. However, um, the laser would just give us more power and oh, it, okay. is, it is stimulated light um, and that is very narrow band so you have a high power density both in, in, in the wavelength space but also um, in terms of, um, of physical space. Okay. And that is again ideal to get um, the, the light coupled into the core of a fiber. It's just nine microns. Um, the fiber itself, if you strip off um, the, the, the coating is like a hair. But hmm. the core of it that actually transmits and, and carries the wave um, is just nine microns in diameter today. Wow. And that brings us to the first problem, alignment. Okay, so you said something about coupling the laser into the cable. Can mm -hmm. you 
expound on that a little bit? What does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah, um, one way to do this is um, using a lens, a small lens, a micro lens, okay. and uh, focus the beam um, into the fiber, into the core of the fiber. That is um, an alignment job, which is often done by... Um, Auto uh, mechanics. Right. For example, <laughs> if you want to go for most bus. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's robotic usually. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. And, uh, and is that important because of the refraction angles that you have to be concerned with as far as keeping the laser within the fiber? Um, yeah, you don't fit the laser totally into the fiber, but you, you can fit the beam into the fiber. And... Um, if the numerical apertures of, of this little mic, uh, the little um, uh, lens um, and the fiber end are matched to each other, you get nearly 90, 90 100 percent uh, coupled into the fiber of, of the power. So we lose very wow. little. And um, if you compare that to a light emitting diode, uh, which has a broad angle, uh, you would have difficulties to focus all that power into it because the um, the numerical aperture or the focal length of such a lens um, wouldn't go together with the numerical aperture of the fiber. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that it's just a receiver and a transmitter and some sort of transmission line. That's pretty true for most electronic communication, right? We, you know, we've, we've talked about USB-C and PCIe. It's all the same type of thing. How, how, what sort of similarities are there between the electronics communication or maybe even RF where we're talking about antennas and transmitters and receivers to optical? I would say the, the closest match is probably a coax, a coax cable. Okay. Um, a coax cable that is um, triggered or is, is fed with a electrical pulse signal and the receiver. We didn't talk about the receiver yet. In, in our case, it's photodiodes. And... Um, a photodiode alone uh, wouldn't be very, very sensitive. So um, there is a transimpedance amplifier behind it. Um, most um, uh, uh, circuits are um, using the, uh, the photodiode in reverse direction, and the transimpedance amplifier is then using, um, used to, to um, create voltage out of the photocurrent and amplify it by the same time. Um, okay. That gives us an electrical signal at the output. So we are talking electrical in, electrical out, and it's, it started all off with pulses, like uh, in the case of, um, of coax cabling. Okay. Is it, is it a binary communication system, or is it more of a frequency type? It started off with binary, and um, today uh, we're talking about such crazy things at 64 gigabaud times uh, QAM64. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk about that in another episode, I think. Yeah. Well, what I was going to ask... it sounds add, really cool. <laughs> yeah, and this sounds, this sounds really complicated, so it begs the question, it's something that we always try to ask our, our guests, is what, what problem is this addressing? Why, why do we have optical versus just... How did it come to be? Yeah. And Yeah. yeah. Uh, the beginning was um, distance times uh, regeneration. Um, Okay. The, the history of, of long-distance communication has a lot to do with, um, with um, trains. And hmm. um, it's, it's an episode, I think it's true, maybe it's not, that um, the distance between two of these small huts that would sit next to a train line, a train track, um, are about 80 kilometers in European dimensions um, apart. And um, so the telecommunications industry, starting off along train lines, hmm. um, had a chance to regenerate the signal every 80 kilometers. And this is like telegraph lines or? That was telegraph lines, okay. yes. And uh, when, uh, when this infrastructure, and since this infrastructure existed, um, the 80 kilometers has made it into the, into the history of the system. Um, and the first... Um, fiber optic communication links also had this regeneration every 80 kilometers. And um, it was around the 1990s that um, erbium doped fiber amplifiers um, became a reality. That is, to cut it very short, 
a, um, an, an optical amplifier that takes optical input and gives optical output in an amplified fashion. It does not change the wavelength, it does not change the polarization, and it does not change the signal. Um, the only thing it does is it adds some noise, so it has a noise figure. Okay. And um, um, also there is a wavelength dependent gain. Now this made it possible to bridge um, long distance um, with reamplification, but without regeneration. So the signal didn't get distorted anymore. Oh, okay. So, so regeneration was something. So you'd almost have like a telegraph operator every eighty kilometers who's like retapping out the signal, or, or? In, in the very, very, very early days, this was the fact. Actually, they had really? um, line of sight communication, and then you would um, have somebody who writes it down and then retransmits it sure. to the next station. And the same would happen in the in the electronic region, right? Smoke so, signals, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, um, you receive a signal, you store it in, and uh, you create a new um, noise-free um, and, and strong signal out of it. A lot has to do with the, um, with the distortion and the noise that is being added along, along the line, plus um, or mainly driven by the loss that is along the line. Okay. And now we're coming to the point. Um, fiber optic has a very low loss, um, especially modern fiber optic fiber has um, in the area of 0.1 dB per, per kilometer. Wow. That, if you compare it to a BNC cable, is very, very little. Yeah, so, that's nothing. Right. And well, it's not nothing, I'm sure, but it seems like... No, it's, it's really, it's, it's very, very little. And um, now think about undersea communication. Right. Um, here we have extreme distances. And of course, there are uh, these amplifiers built into the cable and, and they're well sealed. But you want to have as few as possible of those because whenever you have to pull them up to, to do maintenance, this is a major thing. You have a ship rolling out, you have um, to find the fiber, the cable, which is about as thick as you, your arm, not mine. <laughs> yeah. ball. Mike's arm. Yeah, <laughs> strong arm. So, okay. And, and pull it up and then uh, break it, uh, re reconnect it. I have so many this. questions about yeah. like, right. transatlantic. So, I understand theoretically, like conceptually, I can understand that they run a fiber optic cable from the east coast of North America to the west coast of Europe. But practically, how does that even happen? Like, is it a consortium of who? I, I don't know how to. Yeah, who what pays is that for ecosystem? it? What about, yeah. the, uh, what about the fault lines at the bottom of the ocean? Is that moving stuff around? You know. And this might be more than. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, well, this is uh, this is big uh, companies today. Um, it's usually a consortium. So you, you would, for example, find C C M E W E or so. This is a, a consortium of, of multiple companies that are usually um, uh, bound to one of the landing points. So um, let's say Japan and U.S. and mm -hmm. um, or. If we are in Europe, there would be France, Netherlands, and the UK who are contributing to a certain uh, section of this fiber network. Okay. And they will build a consortium, and um, these people will take care of, of the funding of such um, connections. Okay. Um, on terrestrial links, you often have single companies, and, and this is also a little historic. Um, AT&T was a big... Um, uh, uh, was not a service provider at this time, it was a network provider. And um, in Germany, it was Deutsche Telekom who owned these long distance lines. And when you say network provider, you mean they're physically installing and maintaining? They're physically installing and maintaining connection. it, yes. And okay. um, as soon as the, the, the competition came in, um, like local exchange carriers and regional exchange carriers, um, in many times they would lease bandwidths from from these big networks, okay. and um, that was one of the business models to to actually lease out um, dark fiber, as we say. Dark fiber is fiber that has not been lit with a signal, and um, that was um, installed as a reserve for for the big network, and then they sell this capacity. How how common is dark fiber? Because it seems like if you're going to go through the expense of installing it, you'd turn it on as soon as you. 
Well, at the same so time, that, too, right. if you do need to expand uh, bandwidth later, it's probably easier to do it up front than to dig it back up from the C4. That makes sense. Right? Like, let's, how, how much does this much fiber cost versus this much fiber cost? Why not just do 20 times more than we need and see where it takes us? Is that yeah, kind of the idea? It's actually not the fiber that's costly. It's, it's the truck rolls, okay. as they say, or... Um, in Europe, it's often the, the way of right. So, um, uh, right we away. have we have okay. a lot of regulation where, yeah, right away, where um, it's not so easy to bypass somebody's land. And huh. once you have this, you want to put as, man, as much fiber in it as you can, or let's say, a reasonable pack. Sure. Right. And then you sell the the bandwidth. I think how nice area. it would be if they built all the freeways out here with like twenty lanes, both ways, just to future proof it. That, how, much, yeah. how much nicer would life be right now? <laughs> it'd be it'd be pretty stellar, but uh, imagine taxes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it costs a little bit more, but hey. So speaking of maintenance, I guess is what what sort of maintenance is required on? So you said if something breaks, you know, heaven forbid, a that's pretty common. Transceiver um, breaks in the ocean, and so yeah. you send out a ship, and they you said they have to cut it. And um, you you pull it up, and okay. uh, you have to repair it somehow. I mean, this is high pressure stuff, so um, it's it's uh, can be kilometers under the sea, under the uh, surface. So this must be really um, well sealed. And we're talking about um, that's that's one of the purposes of dark fiber, for example. Um, you can use it as a sensor. So fiber can not only be used to to transmit signals. You can also use it as a sensor because it's. Sensitive, for example, to um, water that goes in between um, the plastic shield and the coating. It changes the refractive index on the outer level, and uh, there's enough change so you can see on reflections and, and on um, other effects that the sensing people are That's studying. pretty cool. Yeah, that's kind of genius. So water in the lines is probably a bad thing. I that's absolutely bad, yeah. So it's like, what's worst case scenario for... On, on land, it's um, cable being dug out by someone installing a sprinkler we, system in their yard exactly <laughs> weekend uh, always call before you dig right yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's quite common and uh, in the sea it's anchors um, ah. if you're this is not so much in, in in the middle of the ocean but at the landing points okay. there was a case um quite recently um i think it was um off the coast of france that had to be repaired no it was actually no it was in 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 um in Japan, someone dropped anchor, and um, is it gla fiber optic cable? It's what is it made out of? Oh, there's a lot of materials, and there is even um, steel shielding and aluminum. There is um, hmm. um, a um, what's a rubber type thing. Okay, I'm I'm not so much into the materials, okay. um, but it's it's really um, like a really strong. Um, high voltage cable, if if you want. Sure. And inside we have this little glass fiber or a bunch of glass fibers. Okay. I, I wanted to say the third factor is actually earthquakes. So. Oh, uh, okay. Um, so you said fault lines earlier. Yeah. Is the cable, and I'm stuck on this, you know, ocean floor thing still. But is the cable resting on the bottom, the bottom of the ocean, and it just kind of. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's resting there. And what you do is you make sure that you have a um, little extra path. So um, when something happens, there is some elasticity also okay. for, that makes sense. for the tectonic um, uh, changes. So you could say it's almost kind of kind of like this microphone cable where it's just laying yeah. on the bottom of the yes. ocean, right? Yeah, it's not bolted down to the ground or anything like that. Yeah. Huh. Huh. Interesting. So in Germany, do you have those claw machine games? Because that's kind of how, it, you know, where it's like a claw hanging down and there's a thing of stuffed animals and you have to like line the club that's how i kind of picture them pick fishing the line out of the bottom of the ocean like someone's career was you're telling me james cameron isn't down there in a submarine like with a welder fixing the wires down at the bottom of the ocean <laughs> very, very <sighs> possibly be, yeah. that'd be way cooler well that's yeah, it's a high technology thing so the, these big ships um um employ the latest technology in terms of submarine um working working in very deep um oceans and but that's one of the reasons why you pull it up because you don't want to to perform all this work um at these pressures and the the the, the more you take it to the to the surface the better it is okay to handle yeah i guess that makes more sense 
That is fun, yeah, though. But still, but. inspection is a thing. I mean, you don't want to pull it up to inspect it. So you uh. want to, to use submarines to inspect the cable on the ground. Do they have, like, a crawler that's just checking the cable? I imagine there's, like you were saying earlier, you can check reflections and transmission attenuation and see the quality of your cable? I don't know about crawlers, but that... Um, the, the, the um, you can actually find breaks and also losses that come from, from sharp bends uh, using a technology called OTDR, Optical Time Domain Reflectometry. Okay. And um, there you can, um, from, from a certain measurement point, you say it's um, a distance of 10.5 kilometers. And then you know there is, a, as we call it, an event. It can be a break, it can be a loss, a sharp bend or something, or water. Okay. And, TDM uh, is popular in, in, in standard electronics too, yes, right? To find yeah. fault lines on circuit exactly. boards. Same yeah. principle. Yeah. There TDR boards and things. Are, have you ever gotten to demo one? Uh, yes, fun. actually. On the, on the Field Fox product, we have you can just, TDR like, in it. We have this board that we like to show off TDR with, and you just poke your finger on the trace, and you can like watch the screen signal change as you <laughs> put your finger on different points in the trace. It's pretty fun. Yeah, you couldn't do, do this with optics too. You take the fiber, bend it a little bit, or wire it around, uh, wrap it around a pin, and then you will see a sharp decline hmm. at this Interesting. point. Interesting. Yeah. So how do they? How how do you actually do? So optical TDR, you have to both transmit and receive from the same fiber. Is that you send in a pulse under, under simplification? You send in a okay. pulse. You wait for the reflection. Um, or, and, and that's probably the other uh, analogy for a uh, distributed reflection. So um, that gives you a, um, a steady decline of the received pulse or of the received signal, and, and that corresponds with the loss at distance. So okay. You get this, uh, this trace, a declining trace that is uh, pretty linear, and um, th actually the slope uh, tells you the dBs per kilometer that we spoke about earlier. You can measure this from a distance, uh, which is also nice mm. because uh, sometimes you sure. have different types of cables, uh, different types of fibers, uh, fusion spliced um, together, and um, they may be different in, in terms of their um, coefficients. It's going to be a tough measurement. These, th these cables have to be transmitting data close to C, the speed of light, right? Probably not completely the speed of light, but... Well, the speed of light in a fiber optic channel. Right? Yeah, so, it, so what, what, what is the speed? I mean, if we're talk, even if going across the ocean and back, is it, is it like the milliseconds of delay? Well, we can calculate that. Um, the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, and uh, we have a refractive index of 1.48, 1.5. That gives us about uh, 200,000 kilometers per second. It's pretty quick. Sounds fast yeah. to me. How does it compare to uh, this? I don't know if you know this. 5G latency is supposed to be a big... Mm, latency is a different thing. I mean, the channel okay. itself has, has a, also a pretty short delay. And this is just okay. the, the, the travel of the signal over uh, between the antenna and the antenna. Um, what makes the delays in, in, in the um, data crunching in the digital signal processor that's behind and that There's nothing different in... Uh, in fiber optics. We, meanwhile, we also do not only uh, uh, convert from optical to electrical, then we also do digital signal processing, we do storage, we, uh, we combine multiple lanes into bytes, um, where previously had been bits, and then we do QAM64. This is a lot of digital signal processing, and it adds delays. So how hard would it be for an RF engineer to transfer over to optical? Someone who's been doing easy. You know, that's pretty easy. Simple. That's that's what many people do. Okay. I mean, interesting. When I studied, um, we got very basic knowledge about fiber optics at all, and um, my fellows would all come from RF. They would come hmm. from from um, yeah. They would be EEs and come from RF. Well, that must be a nice transition because I'm not I'm not an RF expert. From what I remember. From my college days, one of the biggest struggles with RF was the channel itself, uh, trees and buildings and atmospheres and, and uh, electromagnetic interference. But within an optical channel, you have pretty solid control over the, over the medium, 
right? It's it, there's not a whole lot of variables as far as to over what's unless there's a, a bend or a break or something, right? Yeah. Hmm. True and um, changing. <clears throat> it used to be true until until uh, briefly ago. Now um, we're squeezing so much signal, so much bandwidth into the fiber that um, small um, environmental changes can actually influence the fiber. Um, then there's dispersion, which is another topic we'll talk about mm. in a different episode, I hear. Um, there was a recent case where, where um, uh, flash light, no, what was it, thunderstorms um, created uh, influence on fiber optic links. So, Like nobody, electromagnetically? Yes, it's, um, it's very strong electromagnetic fields um, huh. that are very pointed. If this that comes together... Sense. Uh, we have the same situation as, as with one of these sensors. And again, fiber uh, tends to be a good sensor for some of these um, huh. field changes. So the, the way I picture fiber is it being a good sensor like on the tips, but not so much along the cable itself. Is that true or just me being naive? <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, I wouldn't say it's naive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in fact, it, it is a good sensor along its length. Okay. And that's exactly for, and, and again, for these changes um, that can be either strain, pressure, temperature changes, or um, bends. Okay. So that's why you put fiber into drill holes for what? Um, oil drilling. Um, they go next to the to the hole and you get a temperature distribution, a pressure distribution along really? this drill hole. And that's a great, uh, a great addition to having huh. point sensors because now you have a distributed sensor. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's called distributed fiber sensing. So, and you were saying this a little bit before we started because we're almost out of time. Um, what, what are the main differences between RF communication and optical communication? So is it a, because I understand we're still working with polarized signals and all that. Is it a, a frequency thing a bandwidth thing is there really a difference polarization is is one of the differences because fiber has a nice um, property it uh, maintains polarization to a certain extent let me make it more precise it maintains the um, relationship of signals that are at the same wavelength um, but at different polarizations so you can actually do polarization multiplexing. Oh, and, okay. And um, that is probably one of the few differences. Aside from that... That's pretty cool. It, it is really very, very comparable to, to radio frequency things. Okay. It's a, an, an extremely high um, carrier frequency with 194 terahertz. 194 terahertz. Right. Okay. And the channel is also very wide. <laughs> we're, we're typically <laughs> talking about 50 nanometer channels, um, the, the, not channels, the windows uh, that are postulated for the telecommunication bands. Um, and 50 nanometers um, translates into 6 terahertz, roughly. Yeah, we don't hear that prefix around here too often. Terra. It's terra. No. I mean, pterodactyl, maybe, is probably the last time I, I heard the word terra. In this it's building. like a trillion dinosaurs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, there we go. Uh, that's with two R. <laughs> ah, okay, there it is. Hmm. Well, I was going to ask, um, we've kind of gone over the basics of optical, where it's being used, what problem it's solving. What problems are, are you running into now with, uh, with optical? You said that we're, you're pushing the speed in the, ch in, in the channel so high that you're running into very sensitive issues. Is that a function of the maximum bandwidth of the material itself, or just the fact that it's it's so high speed now that it's easy to to perturb yeah we probably have to start at the at the cost side um hmm. the la laying out fiber is an extremely costly thing whether it's submarine or, or terrestrial yeah. once it's dug in you don't want to touch it now and and we have been speaking about dark fiber now at, at the point where all dark fiber is used up is lit uh, what you can do is you can increase the usable bandwidth in the same fiber, and that's what the people have been doing since 1990s. We okay. have been increasing the bandwidth um, of, of our transmission. At the very beginning, it was just a single wavelength, maybe not a specific wavelength, just light. And you didn't even use the return channel. You used the second fiber for the return channel. 
Meanwhile, uh, we are using dense wavelengths multiplexing with about 80 channels in one telecom window. And um, each of these is carrying, what, 100 gigabit per second. Um, there is a theoretical limit to how much um, communication, how much bandwidth you can put in the fiber at a given distance. And, and that's the Shannon re relation, or it, it's derived from the Shannon relation. Okay. I'm actually going to cut you off because we're out of time. But that was a great, I, I think we're going to Can we pick it up on the next one? I want to hear, yeah. hear about the Shannon relation. Yeah. So that's, yeah, next time we will talk about how, um, you know, once you lay the fiber, obviously you're invested in that amount of fiber. You don't want to go add more, modify it. So we have to get creative with ways to get more out of it. Like when you exactly double buckle yep. in the back seat to get an extra person in your car. Right? Are Absolutely. we about to have our first cliffhanger of the podcast series? We'll see. I think it kind of is Might because be. it is the next topic we want to talk yeah, about. Next to, time have to wait a couple of weeks though. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all we have time for today. So, Stefan, thank you so much for, for coming out and, and being on the show today. Thank you for having uh, me. It's fascinating stuff. I, I could sit here for hours, and maybe that's what we'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus content. Uh, so we always do predictions as part of the show. Um, to give me time to come up with a prediction, Mike, do you, do you have a prediction? <laughs> I, to be honest with you, I didn't think about a prediction beforehand, but now that I am thinking about it, uh, we are going to have to start considering maybe optical as a way to communicate to outer space. Do we do that already? Maybe that's a bad prediction if it's already happening. Like, for example, if we go to colonize Mars, could we that's use kinda, an optical link to communicate planet to planet? That's kind of where my, my mind was going to. Totally solar from you. Yeah. Yes. Ah, sucks. That's my prediction. Optical links to Mars. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> okay. Do you have a prediction, Stefan? Um, my prediction is that we will use um, optical communication between satellites at some point. Oh, okay. Mine's also space-related because in sci-fi, there's this theoretical method of propulsion where you fire a laser at a light sail of sorts and you can push the ship. So I think you could embed optical communication into your solar sail. light sail huh. propulsion source. So or use it as use the energy sensor as also a communication sensor. I think we can all agree that space is really cool and we should have lasers in space. So I think it's basically coming down, down the same space, page there. Space lasers, yeah. Lasers space. <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's a good place to end. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to the Keysight Oscilloscope's YouTube channel. And you can also listen to this podcast on your favorite podcasting engine, hopefully. So once that gets done, we'll be there. So Thank we you. will see you every, uh, the second and fourth Thursday of every month with another Double E's Talk Tech. We'll see you next time.